is my Lord. It was so vast the crossing I could never fall. From where I was to his demands, it seemed so far. I cried, dear Lord, I cannot come to where you are. He came to me. He came to me when I could not come to where he was. He came to me. That's why to me when I was bound in chains of sin. He came to me when I possessed no hope within. He picked me up and drew me gently to his side. That's where today in his sweet love I now abide He came to me He came to me When I could not come to where he was He came to me That's why he died All right, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we'll continue where we left off last week, amen. Now next week, uh, Brother Kevin Hall will be preaching, we'll be on our final night of our missions revival, and uh, I'm looking forward to that missions revival, uh, where we got a theme about uh, that the whole world may worship, Psalms 33 verse 8 is our theme verse. And our preacher is Brother Kevin Hall, and we're looking forward to God really blessing and using the messages to our heart. That the faith promise will increase, and we'll have more missionaries around the world. We've got some great missionaries coming, some going to Nigeria and Mexico, um, all over the world, amen. And uh, we have a report in from Italy from our missionary that we've been supporting for years, Brother Childers, um, and it's going to be a great, great week. I hope you'll be there. We'll not have any meals uh, during the uh, missions revival, uh, we ain't got to go ahead on that yet, but we're uh, going to have the meeting, and we're not going to put it off uh, unless we have to. And I thank God for um, the blessing. Had a couple of prayer requests uh, uh, emailed in, and uh, one of them was for Miss Rose. So please pray for her, and uh, pray that God would uh, heal that knee surgery, and she'll be back and around. I appreciate. All of you that hand out or send cards, she's a card sender. Amen. She's a card carrier, carrying independent Baptist. Amen. I appreciate that. And uh, she was getting uh, addresses today of our new members and those that visited. And uh, we're excited about them getting a card from our church. All right, First Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, I want to preach on uh, the blessed church, the blessed church. You know, the reason we're blessed because he came to us and we couldn't come to him just as we uh, just heard that beautiful song. But it's a saved church. It's a surrendered church. It's a suffering church. Chapter one, it's a soul winning church. And it's a sound church. And that's where we got into last week. It's a sound church. Second Corinthians, or First Thessalonians chapter two. Let's read verses one uh, through six. 
And uh, you can stand on the Word of God if you'd like and reverence His Word. The Bible says, For yourselves, brethren, know our interest unto you that it was not in vain. And He's validifying His ministry because He's under attack. Can you imagine people attacking the Apostle Paul. But even after that, uh, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, and were bold in our God to speak unto the you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanliness, nor of guile, but we, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time use we flattery words, as we know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you as a nurse cherished her children. How about that picture of the ministry? So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted to you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because we were, you were dear unto us. For you remembered, brethren, our labor and our travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto you, uh, any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. You are witnesses. God also how holyly and justly and unblameable we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. And look at verse 12, and we'll close. It says that we would walk worthy of God, worthy of God who hath called you unto the kingdom and glory. You may be seated as I pray. Father, thank you for a church that's blessed of God. And Lord, you blessed us Sunday. God, we thank you for young couples uh, being sent out of our church to the mission field. We thank you for new laborers coming that are not just joining the church, but, Lord, they want to be a part of the ministry of the church. and That thrills our heart. And God, we thank you, dear God, that uh, we want to be the kind of church that pleases you and not man. And so, Lord, help us as we preach this message uh, and that it might be a blessing and also a correction if there's anything in our lives or our church that's not uh, right with God. Lord, you just help us to see it and we'll correct it. God, we want to be pleasing unto you, and we want you to get great glory from Whitfield Baptist Church. So, Lord, thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. We appreciate all those that's watching by way of Internet. Miss Nancy was telling me that she didn't miss a service. I believe that with all my heart. Uh, she was always with us as she watched on. We had a visitor Sunday morning that has been watching our services for five months, five months without fail because he knew he was going to be coming down to Dalton to be in charge of two trucking companies uh, over there on uh, Bear Creek Road, I think it is. Uh, and um, uh, and he was he was knew he was going to be transferred as manager of those companies to Dalton, Georgia, so he started checking out churches. I'm glad he tuned in to ours, amen. And uh, they, they, were <clears throat> they were blessed by your friendliness. <clears throat> and I said, you ought to see us when we don't have all these barriers up. We're so friendly we can't stand ourselves. But... Um, you know, and and they were really impressed with you, <clears throat> and they already checked out the gospel, how it's preached in this church, how it's operated, and I thank God they're going to be a part of us very soon. So the Lord's blessing, and you ought to thank God for that. And I've been praying for laborers because some people have been um, uh, quitting their post. They've been unfaithful, and I said, Lord, you've got to send more laborers, and God is sending laborers, and I appreciate that so much. And first of all, I want you to see that uh, uh, it was a sound church. It was a church of integrity. Look at verse 3. It says, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanliness, nor of guile. And so we sense that Paul was defending his integrity. Folks, if a preacher loses integrity, he loses his voice. And folks, you know, if you lose your integrity, you lose your voice. And folks, we ought to walk the walk and not just talk the talk. And we ought to back up our preaching with our living. Amen. We ought to be good Christians in the ministry. And the temple of Thessalonica was definitely a place of deceit. And the philosophy of, uh, 
of their of those uh, worshipers was deceit, and so he's clarified it. He said, "Listen, we're not a contemporary church. You come as you are and leave worse than you came. We're not playing the world's music. We're not going to uh, preach the world's message, and we're surely not going to de- deceive you by tra- transliterating uh, or t- uh, perverting and risking the scriptures. We're going to stay with the Bible." And so, folks, we see that uh, number th- also in, in in verse three it says they were free of uncleanliness. And uh, and look at verse five. For neither was any time used we flattery words as as nor cloak of covetousness. God is witness. And so he says God knows our motive. God knows our reason for operation and ministry. And that's very important. And folks, you know there's a lot of seminaries and I call them cemeteries, that teach preachers how to please people. And I want to tell you something, friend. We're not in the people-pleasing business. I don't want to make everybody mad tonight, but I don't, I'm not here to please men. I'm here to please God. And then if I please God, you ought to be pleased. Amen? And that's all by faith. And so we see that uh, a lot of people do community surveys on what to preach, and, and they water it down. And folks, I want to tell you something. God help us never to water the gospel down to try to get a crowd. We must never forget our calling to bring men and women to the Savior. Amen? That is the key, is that God has called us to be a church that wins souls, but don't, but not compromise trying to do it. And then I see in um, some strong verses in Titus chapter 2. If you'll look there, please. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 and 12, the Bible says this, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now look at verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What beautiful verses this is. And look at verse 11. It says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Folks, we need the grace of God to bring his power and his presence to this place. We don't need to conjure it in. We don't need to uh, entertain it in. We don't need to compromise. We don't need to water it down. We don't need to entertain it in. What we need to do is pray and ask God to move in our midst for his glory. And folks, it's not with flattering words. Today, many will argue they're under grace or liberty and they can worship like they want to and and they have no restraints in their Christian life. Well, the Bible says something different in Galatians chapter 5. Look there with me, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. Galatians 5, 13. The Bible says this. It says, For brethren, we have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion of the flesh. Did you hear that? We're We're free. And we're not bound by rules and regulations, but I want to tell you something, folks. We're bound by the Spirit. And where the Spirit is, there is liberty, but there is also restraint. And we dare not grieve the Spirit of God. But look at this. It says in uh, Galatians 5, 13, it says, uh, For brethren, we have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. A lot of people say, well, I'm under grace, so I can... Uh, sin and drink with my buddies and I can live like I want to. Well, number one, if you say by the grace of God, you don't want to. You have a new want to. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away, but all things become new. There's a new want to in your life and if there is not a, a new want to, then something's wrong. The brand of grace preached at the Laodicean church in the last days leads people to believe they can live like they want to. And it's all right with God to live just like you want to. And then other people uh, advocate harsh legalism, and they try to um, add to uh, grace for you to be saved. And God makes it the kind of church um, that's spirit-driven, not market-driven. I'm a marketing major in business administration. I was talking to our new members uh, Sunday night, and I said, I majored in in business because I couldn't take accounting too many quarters, amen? I'd rather uh, uh, work with people than numbers. And, um, you know, I'm going to tell you something, friend. A lot of people are are people-driven. 
and market driven and whatever uh, you want we'll have in our church so we'll grow it's called pragmatism grow in, no matter how what it takes but the Bible tells us friend that uh, no man owns God's church his church is for his glory you look at Acts chapter 20 verse 28 good to see so many young people here tonight amen rode that old bus Praise God, that wasn't fancy. We didn't have rock and roll music on that bus to get them on there. They came because they wanted to hear the Word of God. I appreciate that so much. You encourage my heart, young people, being here tonight. But look at, uh, uh, please turn to Acts chapter 20. Uh, my life verse is Acts 20, 24. Let's go on down a couple of verses. Acts 20, 28. Acts 20, 28. The Bible says, Take heed therefore unto your flock, yourselves, and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. I believe I'll take your hands off God's church. I don't think it's the deacon's church. I don't think it's the preacher's church. I don't even think it's the people's church. It's God's church. And folks, there's a theocracy around here. God rules, amen, and God's right. You know, righteousness exalts a nation. But a sin is reproach to any people. And I want to tell you something, righteousness lifts up a nation. But sin is reproach, it defeats and deflates. And I don't know about you, but we're living in a day that is sin-driven and people-driven and political-driven. Folks, I want you to know we need to have a church that's pure. Not holier than thou, but pure. Pure motives, pure faith. Lord Lord knows why we do what we do here. We ought to always do it for His glory. Then I want you to see also that it ought to be a compassionate, personal church. A compassionate, personal church. Look at verse 7 and 8 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. These verses touch my heart. <clears throat> I hope it will touch your heart. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and look at verse 7. It says this, But we were gentle among you, even as nurse cherith her children. Praise God. What a picture of a personal, caring church. I read you that letter about that lady that got that track, got saved on the second floor of Hamilton Medical Center, and she said, I thank God that you're a caring church for a hurting world. She took that logo off that track. But I want to tell you something. She didn't believe it until somebody left that track and was concerned about her soul, prayed over that track, and she got saved on the second floor of Hamilton Medical Center. Praise the Lord for that. Two little children were saved last week. My wife dealt with one of them, and, and she was been under conviction um, the whole six months of this pandemic because she was under conviction before we had to shut it down. And she waited six months to get saved. Isn't that something? Folks, she could have died and went to hell in six months. But she got saved by the grace of God last Wednesday night because somebody went by on an old rugged bus. Sounds like an old rugged cross. The old, old raggedy bus. Uh, we tried to clean it up the other day, and it took a lot of elbow grease. But I want to tell you something, friend. That's a rescue vehicle. That's an emergency vehicle. Amen? We need to get some more of them. Amen? And I was talking to the um, the newest members and the members that want to join, and they, they already got their CDL license. I said, you shouldn't have told me that. Praise God. I'm glad you got the CDL because we'll put you to work. But, uh, folks, there's a lot more to do than just drive a bus, but I can't think of a better thing to do. But, folks, personal care. It's a personal ministry, gentle, easily approached. We must maintain a strong position doctrinally. Our convictions will cha be challenged, and we need to stay grounded in the Word of God. Jude, verse 22, talks about that. People need to sense the strength of our convictions but also the heart of our concern. Now, I resent anybody that say that we're because we're an independent Baptist church that we're hard. No, we're not hard. We just know what we believe, and we're not going to compromise. But at the same time, we'll reach down to the lowest sinner. We'll reach down to the to the uh, person that needs the Lord, no matter what where they're at, what their income is, what their color is, no matter what, folks, because Jesus would reach after. Jesus would drive the night bus. I heard that one time at uh, pastor school. A guy got up. I didn't know what in the world a night bus was. 
I'll tell you what a night bus was. It's when somebody would ride, drive a bus in downtown Chicago at night. Now, you got to be crazy to do that. But praise God, he said, I believe Jesus would drive the night bus. I said, praise the Lord. I'm sure he would, and it'd have to be Jesus on that bus for me to get on it. But uh, thank the Lord for it. And folks, those kids get saved by the thousands up there, and they won't be shooting people on the road. Dr- I'm going to tell you something, folks. We got a heart problem in America. The violence is a heart problem. These riots is a heart problem. Uh, folks, it's also a family problem. I'm going to do a couple's retreat tomorrow, and they rented a, a, a larger hotel just so we can spread out in a Holiday Inn, a big, big uh, thing, because they knew I wasn't going to come if we was going to be crammed in a little room somewhere, you know, and I, I ain't going to teach through a mass. I can't do it. Uh, it'd be muffled. I got to have, I got to be loud. And so they rented a, uh, changed the whole motel so we could have a large room and spread out tomorrow. You pray for me. But I want to tell you something, friend. That's the hope of America, is that we get back to God and the families. There was a man that was convicted of murder. And the judge said, I'm sentencing you to death. He says, you got any last words? And with tears streaming down his cheeks, he said, I wish I'd had a mother. I wish I'd had a mother. See, before there's juvenile delinquency, most of the time there's adult delinquency. We need parents that will draw the line. We need parents that will discipline their kids. We need parents that will drive their children to love and compassion of their fellow man. I take care of the rights. I take care of all this uh, lives matter stuff because I want to tell you something. Once you're full of the Spirit, you love everybody. You want to reach everybody. You're not prejudiced. You're not partial. You just love everybody. You love them because they're a soul that Jesus died for. And praise God, we look at this world through Jesus' eyes. And if you don't, you're carnal. If you don't, you're fleshly. If you don't, you're selfish. Selfish. I don't want to be a selfish, carnal church, do you? And folks, here it is. He says in verse 7, but we were gentle among you as a nurse cherished her children. Folks, we must maintain, uh, maintain purity, but we need to be full of compassion while we are pure or we're just Pharisees. Say amen right there. We're just uh, rules and regulations. We're looking down at people. Some people will drown when it rains because they got the nose up in the air so much. Amen? And folks, personal compassion, personal caring, but also personal commitment. Look at verse 8. So being affectionately desirous of you, we're willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because we're, you were dear unto us. Did you hear that? People do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. Can I repeat that? Get this, young people. They don't care how much you know. You can get all the knowledge and wisdom of this world, but you're a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal if if you're not full of love. And people can tell why you're in the ministry. People can tell why you're building a Sunday school class. People can tell why you're preaching. And why your motives should be love and compassion. People do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. And Paul gave the true gospel, but he gave it affectionately. And he gave it sacrificially. If you'll read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 sometime, he was beat more than our Lord. He was shipwrecked, stripped, hungry, naked, in peril, stoned five times. More than Stephen, that won him to the Lord with this testimony of a heavenly glaze towards heaven. And folks, I want to tell you something. He paid the price. And he gave his life on the chopping block. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And so we see uh, this church could be called a savior-sensitive church. You know, we have this new term that came out about 10 years ago, and it's blossomed in every town, and it's exploded in every town in America. It's called the seeker-sensitive church. The seeker-sensitive church. That means that you can go to a church and find what you want, not what you need. 
That's a seeker-sensitive church. And the churches are building their programs around what people want. Folks, we don't need sugar sticks. We need the gospel. We don't need to be soothed. Sometimes we need to be rebuked. We don't need to stay in our sins and feel better about ourselves. We need to repent and feel better about God and that we're holy unto him but not holier than thou. And so let me just give you a few things about the Savior-sensitive church. But I want you to notice that this church was personal in its care but is personal also in his commitment. He laid his soul on the line. He said, God only, but also our souls, because we were dear, you were dear unto us. We gave our lives. That's the kind of minister you want. That's the kind of apostle you want to follow. That's the kind of preacher you want to follow. Somebody will give their life to the ministry. It's not just a weekend hobby. It's not just something they do on the side. And they definitely don't do it to get accolades and and um, attention and rewards on this earth. So I want you to see in verse 13 that the Savior sensitive church will be one of a powerful message, a powerful message. Uh, folks, verse 13 sums it up. It says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when we received the word of God which we heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as of the truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. In verse 4, he said this, We've been allowed of God to be put in trust of the gospel, even so we speak. It's a sacred trust to take the Bible and show somebody how to be saved. It's a sacred trust not to risk the Scriptures or twist the Scriptures or even translate the Scriptures to a new version so people can make a lot of money like the NIV and other uh, perversions. Take the blood of Jesus out. Take the uh, virgin birth out. Take all these uh, truths out of the Word of God so it'll be easily read. Folks, I want to tell you something. If you, if you can't understand the King James Version, it's on the eighth grade level. You're indicting your education. You need to go back and sue your teacher for non-support. No, you need to sue yourself for not listening. Because folks, eighth grade level, eighth grade level, reading level. And so anybody can understand the Bible if they have the Holy Spirit to teach them, a resident teacher. But look at verse 13. It says, it's not the word of man, but it's the word of God. Paul's opinion was direct, but it was not just a direct opinion. It was from the word of God. It was the very word of God. And we have the very word of God. I want you to look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23, please. I don't know if I put that verse on the screen or not. I might not have. Uh, but look at look at 1 first, first Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. You know the verse, but I want you to circle it. 123. That's why it's such a blessing to be here tonight, to hear the infallible, inerrant, preserved Word of God. The Word of God, not the Word of Wayne, but the Word of God. It says in verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed. That's man's word. But of, the, of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The word of God liveth. Hebrews 4.12 says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And that sword is a picture of a surgeon's scaffold that divides asunder the thoughts and intents of your heart. It cuts deep. And it shows you what's really in there. And folks, you'll never really get under conviction until you hear from the Word of God you're a sinner and that your sinners go to hell. And when you get under conviction that you're going to hell, you ought to do something about it and get saved. Amen? But you won't do that just by man's opinion. You need the Word of God to speak to your heart. You need the conviction of the Holy Spirit to accompany the Word of God. It's a preserved Word, and it ought to be a preached Word. Look at verse 9, 1 Thessalonians 2. For we remembered, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preach unto you the gospel of Paul. I didn't say that. It says the gospel of God. The gospel of God. It's the good news that God sent his only son to die in your place. And three days later, what happened, young people? Up from the grave he arose, right? Am I not right? And 40 days later, what happened? He ascended back to heaven, and he sent the Holy Spirit down to every believer that will believe in him. 
What a blessing. And so, folks, listen, we need to realize we must come back to the conviction that the gospel alone is enough to draw men to the Savior and bring true spiritual regeneration to a soul. Some seeker-sensitive leaders of this generation have stated that they, the fundamentals are more concerned about purity than they are people. But I want to tell you something, folks. We're concerned about purity, yes, but we're concerned about people because Jesus was concerned about people. But he is also a pure God. He was the living God. He was the perfect God. And the local church is to be a pillar and ground of the truth. And folks, we cannot waver in our doctrinal purity. We need to believe in the virgin birth. We need to believe in the second coming. We need to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection. We need to believe in the blood atonement. We need to believe in the Trinity. We need to believe in His Word preserved, inerrant, inspired, God-breathed. At the same time, Jesus came to seek and to save those who were lost. And so these so-called loving churches that present a psycho babble, deluded truth, they don't really love people or they give them what will change them, and that's the Word of God. Folks, a lot of people will come flocking into a church if they can hear a soothing message, I'm okay, you're okay. But the Bible says we're not okay until we get saved. And righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is reproach to any people. And folks, I don't want to be a reproachful church. I don't want to be a church that brings reproach on God's name. I want to be a church that has righteousness. Not self-righteousness, God's righteousness. You know, folks, every man of God ought to heed this, this calling, this charge. Paul's on his last breath. He's probably looking out the window at the chopping block. Probably there's some other heads that's already rolled out into the uh, courtyard of the jail. And he looks out there and he starts writing a letter real quick, dictating, I guess. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. And I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I want you to see the last words of Paul to a young preacher named Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 4. We'll get to, back to this. You know, a lot of seeker-sensitive churches ridicule preaching. Uh, and they say, they put a symbol of a Billy Sunday on their ads and, and they uh, that's pointing a finger and preaching from the pulpit. It says, if you're tired of this kind of church, come to our gathering. Well, I hope you're not tired of that kind of church. Yes, there's caustic pulpits in the fundamental churches, but I want to tell you something, folks. We don't throw the baby out with the bath. Say amen. Folks, we don't stop preaching strong, uncompromised, straight from the Word of God preaching. We don't, we're not, we're not, we're, we're, we're not, trying to entertain or hijack some other church or proselyte some other church. Folks, we need revival. And there's no revival without prayer, and there's no revival without humble humility, and there's no revival without turning from our wicked ways, Said Chronicles 7, 14. Preach the word of God with authority. Declare the truth of God. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 4, you thought I forgot that we were going there, didn't you? Yeah, I knew you did. I could tell the way you looked. Yeah, he's already forgot where he's going. Sometimes I do. Yesterday I was at a preacher's meeting, and they, uh, Brother Austin Garner pointed out to every preacher that Wayne Cofield is the oldest preacher in this room. I said, well, I appreciate that. God bless you. And he was telling his story about how he was spared from COVID and how he, how he didn't remember anything for 29 days. And he said, I'm the oldest preacher in that room. And I was. I, I, I did a survey after the four other preachers, and all of them were younger. I couldn't believe it. But look at this. They all looked older. But anyway, look at if you pastor for a while, you'll look old too. Amen. But look at verse 1. It says, I charge thee before God. I charge therefore before God. Folks, I want to tell you something. You are to answer to God when you teach a lesson, when you preach a sermon. It says, the Lord God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, at his appearing in his kingdom. Now here it is. Preach the word. Didn't say a thing about a drama. Didn't say anything about a praise team. Didn't say anything about a rock and roll band. 
Uh, folks, that's just the wrong vehicle. That's like putting Scripture on a beer can. That's the wrong vehicle. You don't put uh, good gospel music with rock and roll music. That's the wrong vehicle. Don't mix it. Don't dilute it. Look at this. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. You've been instant in season, out of season, or have you quit? Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and what? Doctrine. Folks, we need to teach what the Bible says. We need to be concerned about the purity, but we need to be concerned about people. And folks, we need to realize that when the Apostle Paul charged the, tr the true uh, ministry is this, preach the word, preach the word and reprove and sometimes even rebuke. I had a great question asked me or asked my wife this morning about 1 a.m. She said, I'm going to ask a very uh, a stupid question. It was not stupid. It was one of the most intelligent questions I've ever been asked in my life. She says, what exactly does it mean to join the church? And I started researching that. And I've got something I'm going to give you to, uh, Sunday about the reason to join a church. And folks, it's not to get what you want. It's not that your tithe makes you eligible for all the blessings in the church, the programs. Everybody calls us, what program you got for the youth? What program have you got for the senior citizen? What program? And how, uh, they ought to said, how often y'all eat? Oh, that'll get a Baptist coming, amen. Praise God, he'll get me coming to church. But no, but uh, you know, how, how often y'all sing and how long do you preach? And it's all about self. And folks, what it ought to be is, what opportunities would I have to serve God? Uh, how much uh, does your people need loving some more? How much does your people need caring about? Uh, how much can I get involved in the ministry? Never heard that phone call. Now, thank God I had some members just recently ask how they get involved, and that thrilled my soul. But folks, I want to tell you something. We need to be long-suffering. We, don't, we need to be doctrinal. Now look at verse 3. For the time will come, and we're here, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. You know what the word sound means? Straight down the line, letter rip, preaching and teaching. Amen. And folks, I, th I, I guarantee you we could fill this place up if I just loosen up a little bit and we could have a little more fun. God didn't call us to be happy. God called us to be holy. But when you're holy, then you'll be happy. Because I've never seen a person happy that's not right with God. Righteousness exalts a nation. You know what that means? It lifts you up. It exalts a nation. But sin is reproach to any people. And I think it's very reproachful. And I wish it had been brought out in that uh, argument last night called a debate. How many babies are going to be killed because of these pro-choice people wanting to get into office. I mean, you know, you talk about thousands of people getting killed because of this pandemic and thousands could have not been killed if we'd done this or, or closed the borders or, or stopped the Chinese coming in. I want to tell you something. My question is how many babies that don't have a virus, all they have is birth, are getting slaughtered on the altar of convenience and they're baby killers. And God help you if you ever vote for one of them. To get right with God. And I want to tell you something, friend. You need to vote by the doctrine of the Word of God and who will try to carry it out. Not personalities. We found that out last night. You no know, personalities about it. But I'll say this. How many babies have been slaughtered and how many babies will be slaughtered if we don't get a conservative judge in? No, we got to balance the court. We don't need to balance the court. We need to have the doctrine of the Bible in the court. We need to have the doctrine of the Bible in the White House. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm not concerned about the White House as much as I am God's house. The churches are diluting the Word of God. The churches are doing this. They're enduring, They're not doing sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Now, the teachers aren't got the, haven't got the itching ears. They've got the itching ears. Saying, entertain me, preacher. Give me 17 ways to, to uh, increase my self-image. If I hear another message about that, I'm going to croak. 
Folks, I don't want to hear about self-image. I want to be here about God's image. I want God to be lifted up, not man. 17 ways you can be successful. Well, that's great, but if you leave God out, I don't care how much money you make, you're not successful. And you will not prosper. Seek ye first the king of God and his righteousness, and then, and then all these things will be added to you. What things? The things you need. Amen. I'm preaching now. And I want to tell you something, folks. It says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. They'll turn their ears away from the truth. Why aren't fundamental, Bible-believing, doctrinally straight, King James-only, old-fashioned churches not growing as a whole? There are some churches that are growing. And I'm so excited that we're growing again. But folks, they turn from the truth. I'm not saying everybody left this church is turning from the truth. But some of y'all are listening very well now that you've left it. But I want to say this. It says, but... It says, and they shall turn away from the ears of the truth and shall be turned into fables. I'd rather hear a good illustration, a good joke, a good entertaining speech or talk. Don't ever call my sermons a talk. It's a message. It's a message not from Wayne Cofield. It's a message from God. Because that's where I get my messages, from the Word of God. And look at this. You, you accuse me of not doing a lot of things in these last 43 years. But I guarantee you, you can never accuse me of not preaching the Word of God and teaching it and teach. I used to be a Sunday school teacher for 38 years around here. Thank God somebody filled the gap. But look at this. It says this. But watch thou in all things. Endure affliction. Do the work of evangelists. You know what the work of evangelists is? There's got to be conviction. For them to be evangel to be evangelists, there must be a prophet that rebukes sin because people are not going to get saved unless they get sick of their sin. We must preach against sin. We need to love the sinner, but preach against sin. Now, I'll, I'll close. It says, but watch thou in all things endure affliction, do the work of evangelists, make full proof of thy ministry. Full proof of thy ministry means, does God is God pleased? Let me give you another question. Is God honored? Does the music honor God or does it honor the musician or the song leader? Does it honor God? Is it biblical? Is it, it, can you hear the message? I've been in some churches, you couldn't even hear the message. Fog machines going on. Boys with no shirts on that has J-E-S-U-S on their chest and jumping up and down. Man, I'd have a heart attack if I had to join that church. I guarantee I couldn't make it. And I thought, what is this? It's not even a rock concert. It's it's a ruckus. It's 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 confusing. Man, they're worshiping God. The other day I went by a church up in Chattanooga. It's called the Venue, and they had a um, a picture of. Uh, Star Wars, and you go through the Star Wars tunnel to go into the auditorium. Then it had another picture of Jurassic Park. You go through an elephant's mouth, I guess, to get into the Sunday school wing. And it was just, then it had on the side of the hill, Hollywood. And that was their big promotion. And I, I, I got upset about it, and I put something down, and man, I got all kinds of ladies jumping my uh, Facebook saying I was a heathen, not loving their church. And I said, well, I'm going to tell you something. Last time I checked, Hollywood's not promoting God. And Hollywood's not promoting righteousness. And Hollywood's not promoting turning from sin. And folks, I want to tell you something. It's not a church. It's just a gathering. Heaping themselves itching ears. With itching ears. Make full proof of thy ministry. I don't care what Hollywood thinks. By the way, what right does a guy that can carry a ball across a goal line or dunk a ball in a hoop have any kind of political influence on our nation? They're just ball players. I know they're millionaires, but we've made them heroes. 
but they're not political directors of our nation. Listen to God's man. Listen to God's word about uh, what is sin and what is uh, righteousness exalts the nation. Sin is a reproach to any people. And people are going to listen to people that's been married five times. They're going to listen to people that are that are living in adultery. They're going to listen to people that's been on drugs most of their life and they're fighting the battle now. Maybe they're overcoming it. No, friend, we need to listen to the word of God, not politics, not some uh, ball players that's going to use their heroism to influence the nation how to vote. God help us. God help us. The folks when it creeps in the church, it's even worse. Let them keep it in the ball stadiums. I don't care. And I'll tell you what, if it comes in the church, we're politically motivated and politically driven and man-centered and divide over this and divide over that, then we have a mess on our hands. Folks, I have fought a good fight. It's not easy to fight a good fight. I have finished my course. And here it is. I've kept the faith. Folks, that was his last words. He said to Timothy, one more verse, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give to me at that day, not only to me, but to all them that love his appearing. Let me say this, friend. You don't love his appearing if you're living in sin. Well, if you have a bud stupid in your hand, a beer, and all of a sudden the rapture takes place, I guarantee you hope to God when the rapture takes place. And if you go up, I'm not saying uh, you're not, but if, if you go up, you're going to pray to God that's not still in your hand when you face Jesus. Say so, amen. Righteousness exalts the nation. But sin is reproach. My daddy was a drunk. My daddy burnt the house up. My daddy wrecked the cars. My daddy caused us to be starving half the time because he drank it up before he got saved. And so I preach against liquor, but I love, I love the sinner. I love the sinner. And love won my day to the Lord. And on his deathbed, he said, I wish there had been one thing that took place in my life earlier. I wish I'd have got saved when I was young. Because Wayne, I only lived seven years. So he got saved at 63. He died at 70. Don't waste your life, young people, on sin. Because one day there's a crown laid up for you if you love his appearing. And the only way you can love his appearing, number one, is you're saved. And number two, that you're sanctified by his word, set aside, trying to live the best you can for God. Let's pray. Father, use this message. Thank you, dear God. For the Savior-sensitive church that we want to be, not the seeker-sensitive church. God, help us to be a personal church that cares personally about people, and knows their names and goes to their houses and feeds their stomachs, but also feeds their soul with the Word of God and counsels with them at the midnight hour and prays with them and stands by them in the hospital when they're scared to death the child's not going to make it through surgery. God help us. God help us to be like the Apostle Paul admonished us to be like a nurse to the child, like a father to his children. Help us to be a personal, compassionate, but pure and holy people that reaches out to a lost and confused and dying sinful world before it's too late. With every head bowed, every eye closed, most important part of this service, the invitation. I want to ask you a question. If you died today, and there's a lot of people dying, or the rapture took place, do you know you'd be with Jesus? If you're 100% sure of that, and you know you're saved, I mean, there's been a time in your life where you accepted the death, burial, and resurrection, and the fruit of it is a changed life. Not you just joined a church. Everybody in Dalton's joined 17 times. 17 different churches probably. It's been born again. But you'd say, preacher, I don't know. Or I do know if I died today, I'd go to heaven. Would you raise your hand as a happy testimony of that? All over this place, amen. You know you're saved. Don't look around and see what Willie's doing or John. Just look in your own heart. How many glad you say, say amen. Several couldn't raise your hand. We love you. 
That's why we preach the Word of God straight. We're not trying to water it down. We're trying to reach out personally to you tonight through the Word of God. But you say, Preacher, I'm not saved. If I died today, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. And I sure want to be sure, and I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. And I want you to please pray for me in your closing prayer that I'd get saved before it's too late. Would you slip your hand up real high for prayer and then back down? God bless you. I see that hand. Anybody else just slip your hand up and then back down? So, Preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved. And I sure know I need to be saved, especially during this pandemic. I know I need to be saved. I don't want to go to hell. Anyone else? One's raised their hand. How about you? Anyone else? I'll wait just a moment. Have me say, Preacher, I want to be that kind of Christian. I want to be a Christian that people can tell that I'm Christ like. And I want to be, I want to, I want to go by the word of God, not by my whims and my wants and my desires. That's dangerous. That really is. I just want to follow the Lord and I want to follow the Word. And I want to be a Christian that's attractively different, distinctively Christian. That's the kind of Christian I want to be. I want you to pray for me. Would you slip your hand up real high for prayer? All over this place. I got to raise mine. I want to be more like Jesus. I don't want to be like somebody else. I just want to be like Jesus. Father, thank you for the good liberty. Thank you, God, for the strength to preach. You know how I'm feeling. God, I pray that you'd help me, God, to be the kind of preacher that Paul was. God, the kind of Christian that he was. Lord, I pray for these that raised their hand that they did not know they're saved. And during the invitation, come down this aisle and let them show, them, show, show them in the Bible how to be saved. Lord, it's eternal life. You don't get saved every Tuesday or every Wednesday or every Sunday, but it's eternal. So, Lord, help them realize where they stand with you and help us all Lord as Christians uh, Lord just to live like you and please you help, uh, help our church Whitfield Baptist Church to be a church that pleases God everything else take care of itself we'll thank you in Jesus name Amen